I've joked with the staff before. Um, I know you've probably seen in social media, there's people now called influencers, right? That's, that's kind of the self-title that they give one another. I'm an influencer. And so I was just joking with the staff. I said, I think I want to change my title of Pastor John just to be hip and current to Influencer John. How about that? Well, you got to be careful what you talk about because the staff ended up creating me a plaque. This is the office of Influencer John. And I also say uh, I want to be the boss of the number one workplace in Iowa, and that's all engraved in there. So there it is. I got to be careful what I joke about with this group, but it's fun. We have a good time together. But as you think about it, we all are influencers. Each one of us. You have a family or group of people that you are associated with that you give input to, you share life with. You work at a job where you have some influence of some sort to affect somebody's life. Influence. We can either use that to make life better for others or we can make it worse. The greatest, greatest influencer of all time that the world has ever known, his name is Jesus. The Son of God that taught us how to live, he died and he rose again so that we may live forever. That's the greatest influence we could ever have, the love that is imparted to us and shown to us through him. We started the journey last week through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' sermon where he asks questions and he teaches us about what he desires his followers to be like. In a world where people today question who Jesus is or don't believe in him at all, or they believe that the Bible is outdated, it's important to look at what Jesus actually said. And even us as Christians, sometimes we think, well, I know what Jesus said, but do we actually take a look in time of what he has asked of us as his followers? We can create these ideas of what we think Jesus wants. Maybe we need to dive a little deeper into his word. At any rate, with the Sermon on the Mount over these next weeks, it's an exciting journey of seeing God's heart and how He desires us to live. We saw last week how we are to be blessed, and it's different than what the world says of being blessed. It means for us to be wholly dependent upon who Jesus is. And we pray as we go through this sermon series that we would be drawn to repentance and life change in our hearts and minds, that we would be influenced by the greatest influencer of all. Once we hear these words of Jesus, how will we live our lives differently? What is God asking us to do or be different? This sermon spoken by Jesus was being shared with his disciples on a hillside. Other people gathered around to listen to him, and they found life in these words. You see, he's talking about all the countercultural values of being a part of his kingdom how he desires us to think and be and do in the world. He addresses the crowds with these values of this new kingdom, that this kingdom isn't out here, but it's in here. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds. And last week, we talked about being dependent. And this week, Jesus quickly challenges us then with what are we to do? Let's pray. Father, thank you for everyone gathered here this day. Thank you that you are so good. God, awaken us by your Spirit if we don't know that. Holy Spirit, teach us this day. Maybe these are words we've heard before many times. But Father, you want change in our hearts and our minds to be more dependent, more fully devoted to you. Help us do that that all glory and honor in this life that we live goes to Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Please turn with me to Matthew 5, the Bibles that are before you, in, in front of you in the chairs. We get done with the introduction to the sermon on the Beatitudes, and now... We look in Matthew 5, turning to verse 13. 
If you're unfamiliar with what that is in Scripture, there's two different Bibles. My Bible says 1378, if you need to look there. Matthew 5, starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. As I mentioned earlier, there are influencers in our world today, and I didn't know a lot about this individual, but I guess this person's rather popular on Instagram. Addison Ray, an influencer in social media, 40.2 million Instagram followers. 40.2 million people desire to hear what this young girl has to say and what she is selling. She is in cooperation with Air Apostle and Disney. She promotes a lot of stuff. She appeared on The Ellen Show. She has a podcast with her mom. She is a big deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. She's kind of a big deal on social media. And a lot of people are hearing what she's talking about. She's an influencer. And she's prompting other people to act in the world in some way. Influence. A person or thing that influences another. Influence. Biblical scholar John Stott states the word influence can sometimes be used for a thirst for power but it also can be used in an unselfish way. The desire of a Christian who refuses to acquiesce to the status quo, they were determined to see things changed in society and to have some influence for Jesus. Because the question we have to ask ourselves is are we really powerless in the world? As followers of Christ, are we powerless or is there a quest for social change that could actually take place? Or can we in some way influence others for Christ? Well, friends, when we look around culture, we recognize we're not in heaven yet. Sin is always crouching at the door. Selfishness is always a struggle. Culture exhibits values that we might not agree with. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we exhibit things we don't want either. Amen? Amen. We don't gather here because we're perfect. We gather here because we need Jesus. We are inconsistent in our own lives. But Jesus talks about today as participants in his kingdom, we are to persevere, we are to serve, we are to love, we are to forgive, to live a life that would reflect the love of God and the joy that God gives us. We are to be influencers, each one of us, for good, to reflect the greatest influencer of all time, Jesus. Dallas Willard talks about how Jesus' teaching style was different than what we experience today. I found this fascinating. He said, in the time of Jesus, we must recognize, first of all, that the aim of popular teaching in Jesus' time was not to impart knowledge. It was to change life. It was not just to listen, take notes. Oh, that's a good thought. Thank you, Jesus. It was to act differently. That was my prayer today. Lord, I don't want this to just be a speech or a sermon that people are writing notes and go, oh, this is, oh, this is hopefully good. <laughs> but I might actually want to be different. That this Jesus actually affects my life. That I don't come here just to sit, but I embrace the grace of God to share with others. That's the way Jesus taught Dallas Willard said we would probably call it the Sermon at the Sheraton, and we take our notes. 
Jesus was teaching for transformation. We need to change. We all do. Now, of course, there's a requirement of information transfer, but what Jesus was doing affected lives. If we were invited to hear that Sermon on the Mount, would we change after hearing it? The master teacher influencer Jesus uses two images during this short couple of verses here. Very practical verses, something that listeners then and us today can understand. Participants in God's kingdom are to be salt and light. Scholars note that salt in Jesus' day was very precious, and throughout history, salt was used to pickle and preserve food. In a time, at that time, there was no refrigeration. You couldn't make ice. Salt was super valuable, and it was used by everybody. Salt was so valuable that it's where they get the word salary. The Latin word for salt is sal. Salary is what the Romans would use to pay their soldiers, and it comes from a payment of salt. They actually would pay them in salt. Salt was precious commodity in that day. Tim Keller writes this. He said, the job of salt was to make something taste good. He says he doesn't know about you, but he likes corn on the cob, and you pour salt and corn on the cob. He loves to do that. Well, when you're eating the corn on the cob, you don't say, wow, that's great salt. No, you say, that's great corn on the cob. Why? Because the job of salt, this is, this is great, the job of salt is not to make you think how great salt is, but how the great thing in which salt is involved. The job of salt is not to make you think how great salt is, but how great the thing is in which it is involved. We pour salt on a lot of stuff. He goes on with an example. If you're in a Bible study, you don't, if you're salt, you won't go away saying, well, that person really knows a lot of their Bible. Boy, they have all the answers. They really showed me up. Wow, they are really awesome Christian. No, what happens is when you go away from a small group in which you have been salt, people don't say how great you were. They say, what a great group. What a fascinating truth. It's pretty simple. Salt makes you feel better about life. Christians make you feel better. But religious people always make you feel condemned. I don't know about you, but I grew up in church and I've had to fight this religious sort of rules. And, and it works for a while. But there's so much more. As we're in a loving relationship with God, we just start to do good stuff. We're not focusing on the good stuff. We just do it. Jesus challenged his followers to be like salt, flavoring and preserving the word with the gospel. We also get into light, demonstrating the gospel through godly actions. And once you've discovered the way, the truth, and the life, you can't keep it hidden. Another author said, if, if you're a follower of Jesus living the Beatitudes, you matter. You have an important role to play because we are the salt of the earth. And salt preserves, and Christians help preserve what is good in culture. In the ancients, again, salt was very valuable. The Greeks thought it contained something almost divine. And the Romans sometimes paid their soldiers in salt. And a soldier who didn't carry out their duties was not worth their salt. Ever hear that? Friends, we are a seasoning agent if we follow Christ. You bring a distinctive flavor of God's values into wherever you are. You can make life palatable. Note that salt, when effective, must be in contact with meat or fish that it is to preserve. To be effective, we must be in contact with other people. Where we work, where we live. And this puts us in tension often because dominant in the culture is, is not Christianity. As followers of Jesus, we are citizens of another kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. 
And this kingdom was initiated by Jesus, and now he's teaching us how to live in it, to pursue different values, different ways to live our lives. We're all to be influencers because of the greatest influencer. But he says, what if salt loses its saltiness? What if we stop being contact in the culture? What if we stop living the values and preserving those values and culture? What happens to it? It's thrown out. It's useless. Pastor Bobby Schuler says, the greatest way we can glorify God and to save the name of Christianity in our culture is to be a salty do-gooder. And that's what he's asking us to be, to be salty, to be flavor-filled, life-giving, happy do-gooder in the world. That's you, my friends. That's me. That's what we were meant to be. And I love this line. He says, this is a great challenging comment for each of us. In the further we get from being salty, the further we get from being salty, of doing good in the world, the further we get from being truly human. The further we get from doing good in the world, the further we get from being truly human. The less salty you are, the less human you are in a sense that you are much less than what God intended us to be. God designed us, as the scripture was read for baptism today, it was just beautiful. We are designed to do good works in the world. We are designed to have contact with the world, to influence the world. Do you sit around complaining about life and others? Are you fearful and afraid for your future? Or are you salt? Engaged in the world and others preserving the good news of Jesus in our words, in our deeds, because friends, if we don't do it, who will? So let's be some salty do-gooders right now. I'd like our deacons to come forward that were here this morning. They could come forward. I think one of our greatest witnesses is that we are generous people. As Christians, we, re we recognize of what we have, we need to give, right? Give to the world, for God is generous to us. And one way to do that is through money. Our deacons had a meeting on Wednesday, and it was awesome because they said, we're going to give a reverse offering. We're going to hand out $1,500 this morning to this group to go bless somebody in our community. Or... If you need $100 today and you need to pay a bill, just take it home. I don't want to know what you do with it. They don't want to know what you do with it. So if you would like to bless someone with $100, being salty and being light, we'll get to in a bit, would you raise your hand and we're going to hand out a $100 bill to you. We've got 15 of them to hand out, so please raise your hands. Think of someone. Think of someone who needs help. Think of a bill that might need to be paid. How can we help someone? Salty do-gooders. To influence the world for Jesus. See if there's, Oh, there's some up top too. Up at the... Can we get up there? Do we have enough? I love that. Yes. And last time I said, can you just send me an email about what you did? I don't even want to know that. Just be salt. Help somebody out. Generosity is a way in which the world will see Jesus' love. Boy, we're still handing them out. Any left? All gone. All gone. The next word picture that we see from the master teacher is light. Preserving Christian values in culture through salt, preserving being in contact with culture to help change culture to persevere through culture. Now Jesus talks about light, and he says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. 
Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that you may see your good deeds, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. This is a recreated picture of what it could have looked like in Jerusalem. Just think of Jesus saying these words. You're to be a city on a hill. You can't miss it. Historians write, being raised in the first century Jewish home during that time Jesus walked on this earth, there were traditions where there would be pilgrimages of feasts, celebrations that were anchored in the agricultural cycle of Judaism. In one celebration called the Festival of Booths, or the Tabernacle, this was a grand celebration where people from all over would gather in Jerusalem, and they would celebrate the autumn festival, the autumn harvest. And during that celebration in Jerusalem, there were some specific ceremonies that took place as people came to celebrate, and one was called a temple lighting ceremony. Now, just think about these images that Jesus is teaching with. City on a hill, inside the temple, during this light ceremony, they would have four enormous golden candlesticks in the courtyard of the temple, and they would be filled with 7.5 gallons of pure oil and it was lit, and they used old, worn-out liturgical clothing for the wicks. It was written that the light emanating from the four candelabras was so bright that the Mishnah, that was where Jewish traditions were recorded, said there was no courtyard in Jerusalem that was not lit up by this light. You see, during this festival, the mood was festive. Religious leaders would dance into the night. Elders, deacons, come on. <laughs> they would dance into the night. They would celebrate the light festival, holding bright torches and singing psalms of praise to God. Could we go to that next slide? Just think about it at night. The light that's shining. We see the light shining out of the temple into the darkness around was seen was as a symbol not only of the Shekinah, which was God's glory manifested in the most holy above the ark, which was once filled by the temple, but also the great light that the people walked in darkness were to see, and they were to shine upon them and to dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Light was permeating the darkness, and they celebrated in this temple festival. And with this description, right? This background, Jesus says these words in John 8. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus, the master teacher, uses the symbols around him and the town around him and the light and the festivals to describe who he is for the world. And now he turns here in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you are to be the light of the world. We are to reflect the light through our words and our deeds. Jesus tells his listeners in Scripture today not to hide their light under a bowl. Scholar states this, that in Jesus' day, they'd have little lamps that were lit all of the time because it was really hard to relight. They didn't have matches at that time. They had to use like a flint knife and, and then set a spark to get it going. So they had oil that a lamp was going all the time, and they would cover it with a bowl. So then when they came home, they'd take the bowl off, and it would light the room again. That's what Jesus is saying in here. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. The people would have understood what Jesus was saying here because of this is how they live. The process took a light, long time for there to be light in someone's home, so they wanted to keep it going. And when they got home, they would remove the thing that was covering it. It'd be like a light switch. Jesus says, as light as the world, you were already burning. You were already lit but you are like a light that has a bushel over the top of it. Take the bushel off. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I shared this at Christmas Eve, but it bears worth re repeating. A brilliant biologist said, our bodies are made for light. We know this. When it's dark in wintertime, we need light. The human eye is exquisitely sensitive to light. If you were in a perfectly dark place, you could see a lit match 90 miles away. Our inner systems are also built to respond to light. Light exposure is mysteriously connected to our circadian rhythms and hormonal cycles. There are proteins in our skins which orient themselves around light exposure. There's something deep here that God has already designed in us. We need light, and we need to be light. One author challenges us, though, because sometimes we think it should be political activism then as churches. We should get involved with lobbying and rallying voters and organizing protests and harnessing evangelical movement for political clout. There was one leader that said, we need to make our voices heard in the voting booth. We're not being salt and light the way Jesus commanded. Well, I'm not going to get into politics, whatever you believe in that realm. But if we look at the context in which Jesus is stating this, he's not drumming up anger. He's calling us to holy living. That if we would be holy, loving him, people would see that light. For light simultaneously dispels darkness and illuminates whatever it reaches. And when we properly let our sh light shine before others, we see good works and glorify God. You do whatever you feel you need to do politically. But may we think about what God wants us to do and how we are to live in relationship with Him. We are to be light in a dark world and we are to be salty in an otherwise decaying and tasteless society. The other day I was in the teacher's lounge at the high school. I was subbing and someone asked me about a wedding that I did recently. And so here I was and normally I would just kind of say a few things and then I'd just be quiet. But I shared the scripture verse. There were seven other people in the room. I shared the scripture verse and then I ended up giving a little sermonette right there at, at school. Why? Because I want to be salty. <laughs> Don't you want to be salty? Have courage, friends. We know the truth. We don't need to be afraid. Share your faith. Don't be obnoxious. But share your faith. I like what Pastor John Lovdivina sums it up. He says, salt and light this way. Here's a picture Jesus is painting. Salt is about inner composition. Salt preserves the meat's integrity. Light is about outward display. Light shines, pushing into darkness, helping everyone in the house to see. Salt prevents decay of our own hearts and minds in our society around us. And light perseveres through the darkness. Friends, how do you see your platform to influence others for Jesus? Are you and I a salty do-gooder in the world? Are our eyes looking out to the world to how to influence, or are they down at our navel complaining, concerned, fearful? Friends, we probably won't change the world. It's okay but we could help one person today. We could bring joy. We could smile. We could encourage instead of criticize. We could be salt to preserve the values and beliefs that we hold internally. And we can be light to those that may need to hear the truth. Let's be salty influencers for Jesus that his truth and light are shown to the world. I'd like to close with this quote by Sky Jathani. He says, 
It isn't that Jesus expected each person to change the world through remarkable accomplishments. Rather, Jesus expected his undistinguished followers to be the source of the world's most essential ingredients. An individual by the name of Pliny, who lived in the first century, commented that there's nothing more useful in the world than salt and sunshine. Likewise, in a dark, deteriorating world, there is nothing more wonderful than people living as Jesus taught. The world does not need more ambitious Christians. Our world desperately needs more ordinary lives lived in rich communion with God. Friends, let's be salty. Let's bring light to the glory of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the way that you are the master teacher. Help us, Father, as we, we gather and sometimes things can become so familiar. May your spirit prompt us to look at life differently then. Help us to be salt and light in the world, Father, wherever you place us. May we influence our families, our friends, our workplaces, that the name of Jesus would be honored, in whose name we pray. Amen.